looking for NFL football? Stop right here. You found your home for weekly NFL talk and fantasy football. Coming to you live from the backuppunter.com. This is the Backup Punter Podcast. Now, now, here's your host, the man who thinks fullbacks win championships, Keegan Matheson. Welcome back. This is Keegan Matheson, the Backup Punter Podcast, episode 33. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for listening. Hope your day is going good, and I hope the podcast does not change that, at least. As long as we keep it neutral, as long as we keep it flatline, you know, we don't decrease anything. That's really the goal here. We like to set the bar set the bar uh, at a comfortable level. Today we're going to get into... Week 10, the week that was in the NFL, some good, some bad, some injuries, some Peyton Manning, everything in between. And then, of course, we'll get you set up for week 11. It's getting into crunch time. I know most standard fantasy football leagues, you're going to be looking at your last three weeks, maybe your last four weeks before the playoffs, depending on league size, league, everything. Everyone is different. But uh, I'm in a few tight races in mine. In a couple of them, I've... I'm not up there in points, but I've gotten lucky with the record. And then in another, I've led the league in points, but I'm below 500. So I've got karma balancing me uh, all over the place right now. So it's a little bit deserved. And as always, the Backup Punter Podcast, it is brought to you by the fine people at DynastySportsEmpire.com Fantasy Sports. So whether it's football, NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball, when that comes back around, DynastySportsEmpire.com They've got you covered with leagues, content, rankings, projections, and more. So visit them at DynastySportsEmpire.com. So let's get into it today. I think if you're a regular listener of the podcast, as always, number one, I'm sorry, but thank you. Number two, you'll know that I left off last week's podcast by saying, let's just hope that nothing crappy happens this week. Let's hope that we can just talk football next week, and and we can't really. I won't waste too much time uh, on this again, because we really went in depth last week in episode number 32, which you can find on iTunes, hopefully, if you're subscribed, or on thebackuppunter.com, and it tweets out from the account at the Backup Punter on Twitter. But you can find it in episode 32. We went in depth about, obviously, that Deadspin report, the Greg Hardy Deadspin report. Another one has since come out, and, and of course, everything buzzworthy comes out the day after a podcast. I think this uh, this held true again. The report from the uh, the appeal of, of Greg Hardy, the, the the interaction between Greg Hardy and the league, and this was kind of sickening on, on a different level, in, in a way that just doesn't make your stomach sink like the the police reports and the images did but this one just kind of left me empty defeated and and after the 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 great showboating the the great measures that the nfl has gone to saying we have put in a team to handle domestic violence we have taken these steps we've hired these prominent people these prominent women done all of these things to, to really curb this to get a better handle on this, not just to prevent cases, but to better handle them when they do happen. So, in walk Greg Hardy and his lawyer, who, just by reading the transcript, by reading the port, the report, you know, his IQ can't be that far from Greg Hardy's itself. What they did is they lied, they slut-shamed the girl into making it her fault, again, and they weren't even questioned. The NFL didn't bat an eye. Didn't bat an eye. And they were really allowed to push forth a lot of BS. And it wasn't necessarily taken as fact, but they really weren't challenged. If you haven't read that yet, it is a dead spin report. Go check it out, because that is a a look behind the scenes. And I know a lot of folks are are either tired of or are not comfortable with some of the, the content of the original report, you know, the images and such. And completely understandable. This gets more into the details and perhaps the the legal 
uh, side of it, if you will, if that's something you're interested in. So, so check that out. You know, we won't chew up the podcast with that guy again. We all know he is a dumpster human being, so we'll leave him alone. Another thing in the news this week, Des Bryant. And again, this came just uh, after the podcast last week. Des Bryant blew up at the media. Now, he had been a good boy recently. He got his contract. But, he, you know, Des Bryant is always the hothead. But it has always been in a way where he stops almost maybe just short of the line where it's too much. And he always seems to stop at a point where you can say, you know what, he's just kind of insane, but it, it's just because he loves the game so much. Tony Romo goes to bat for this guy. Uh, Jerry Jones does. That doesn't mean anything anymore. Guy's a lunatic. But uh, I've always kind of had, maybe not a soft spot, but, but I, I've liked Des Bryant. And uh, however it happened, there was a, a, a reporter from Dallas who had just said something along the lines of, you know, the, the Cowboys need more than two catches out of Des Bryant. Obviously, they, they do. And, uh, you know, it, player and media uh, run-ins like this are not as uncommon as you might think. You know, you just don't really hear about them a lot because they don't reach this level and because they aren't the Dallas Cowboys who are kind of the Kardashians of, of NFL football right now. So Des Bryant blew up, and again, no, no need to waste too much time on that. My only opinion on that matter is, if you are going to blow up and be an idiot about that, go out and put up eight catches for 100 yards and a touchdown. And if there's going to be an interception thrown in the end zone at the end of the game, even if you don't catch it, and even if you need to fake giving a damn, at least fake giving a damn, it was, a, it was an ugly one. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Dallas later because they're in a bad place. And I think this, uh, you know, no surprise, the two off-field stories we're leading this podcast with are both Dallas Cowboys players. Cowboys haven't won a game with Greg Hardy in the field, which is good. But, you know, their free fall has almost been overshadowed by all of this uh, off-field stuff. And it's not going overlooked, but the, the Cowboys are way closer to the first overall pick conversation than they are to the playoff conversation, which is wild. And I think things are really going to uh, to heat up there pretty soon. So let's start back on Thursday night football with the jerseys kind of seen around the world. It's uh, If you haven't seen it yet, look up the video of what those jerseys looked like to a colorblind individual. The, uh, you know, the, the single-tone, one-color jerseys they became a big problem for for people who are colorblind because they could not uh, differentiate between them. And the video itself is fascinating. I uh, I feel awfully bad for people who who had to. You know, I guess they didn't suffer through that whole game because they would have turned it off because it was uh, quite challenging. To be honest, I didn't hate the jerseys as much as uh, as much as most people do. Um, I, I liked the Bills more than the Jets, of course. That that shade of green was a little... Ugh. I didn't mind the all red. It wasn't bad. So Jets at Buffalo on Thursday Night Football. We all know that Thursday Night Football is... It's, it's bad football. This week coming up, Jaguars versus Titans. The combination of jerseys and football in that one might put a spike into therapists schedules on Friday if you're a therapist leave some times open on Friday but this week's week 10's Thursday night football game Jets versus Buffalo Bills the Rex Ryan bowl whatever the hell you want to call it it wasn't great football but part of me is still happy to see Rex Ryan get it done it, in the same way uh, in a very twisted way in a parallel universe sort of way He's kind of along that Des Bryant uh, route in my mind where he's a little insane. He, he's not someone I always agree with, but any chance I do get to root for him, I do. They don't always give you the, the opportunity. They don't always make it easy to root for them, but the odd time, it's fun to see. And, and Rex Ryan has those bills playing good. You know, there, There's a lot of holes on that team. Any Rex Ryan team is going to have holes on offense. I think if you wipe out Sammy Watkins, that passing game is troublesome. Charles Clay, he can get bottled up himself, but LaShawn McCoy, 
is impressive to me. Now, I, I wasn't sure about the fit because I think a Rex Ryan team, and I think most people, when you think of a Rex Ryan football team, you think you think more of the Carlos Williams type. You think more of a like Garrett Blunt, a Chris Ivory, Marshawn Lynch, th- that type of thundering runner. And LaShawn McCoy, you know, he, he he was coming off a season in Philadelphia that was still great, but it wasn't his best. Going to Buffalo, not the best climate, maybe, sometimes, for a, a runner of his style, although what was Philadelphia, obviously. I wasn't sure if it would play there, especially with their offensive line concerns, but him in the open field right now looks like he's 21 years old, looks as good as he's ever been. So that's something fun to keep an eye on because the the Bills, you know, they're in that that range with kind of the, you know, the Raiders. They've been bad for so long, but it's 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 hard to root against them, I think. So it's good to see them picking it up. Then we fast forward through Sunday and we actually got a a very good Monday night game. I uh I looked for or sorry, a Sunday night game. Sunday night football. This podcast is being recorded ahead of Monday Night Football, Bengals and Houston Texans, in which I need Tyler Eifert to uh, reach down from the heavens and uh, and grab my hand. So on Sunday Night Football, Arizona Cardinals, Seattle Seahawks. And what a fascinating game that was. You have Patrick Peterson versus Richard Sherman. And Richard Sherman seemed off. I'm not saying he looked bad. I'm saying he... I, he just seemed kind of blank faced, a little slow. The whole I don't know if he's playing at a hundred percent. It was a, it it was strange to see Richard Sherman like that. But then you have you know not only divisional rivals but two of the best teams in that conference. Usually two great defenses, two running backs, Marshawn Lynch and Chris Johnson. The not the uh, not the freshest tires, but making it work. Arizona Cardinals came out on top. Big games from Larry Fitzgerald. Big game from Michael Floyd, Carson Palmer. An effective game from Chris Johnson, definitely, who really fits that scheme. And that's another signing I didn't like. Chris Johnson to the Cardinals, I didn't like that at all. I thought it was just going to turn this into a messy three-way backfield that no one cares about. But he is gashing his way to four yards when he needs to, which is something he often struggled to do. For Chris Johnson, it was usually 20 yards or a loss of two with him dancing around and looking like a fool. Maybe playing with a bullet in his shoulder helps him. Who knows? Maybe I maybe I need to try that out, uh, get shot in the shoulder. Just, you know, a nice non-fatal, a painful one, but it seems to be uh, working out for CJ uh, question mark K. On the complete opposite end of that spectrum. And I can't believe we've waited. How how long are we into this? We're 12 minutes, 13 minutes into this thing. We haven't talked about Peyton Manning yet. Peyton Manning pulled from the game. 5 for 20 for 35 yards, 4 interceptions, 0 quarterback rating. And the reports came out today, which again, Monday, we're recording this, that he has plantar fasciitis. Now, it is... You know, my understanding of this is that he has a partial tear, which is more painful than a full tear, which is something Eli Manning once played with. And my understanding of plantar fasciitis, it, it comes more from a, the basketball side of it. And you hear some people explain this, and it is just a a brutal injury. It's it's one of these things, um, not medically, but in terms of perspective, it's almost like turf toe. It's one of these things that it doesn't sound bad at all. It doesn't. You know, when you, when you hear of a guy with turf toe, you think, oh, come on, it's your toe. But very, very difficult to play with. And especially for a guy like Peyton Manning, who is already not even limited mobility. He is immobile. He does not move. So, so this just turns him into a, a, a sitting duck in that pocket. Can't step into anything. Can't get comfortable. And boy, did that show against the Kansas City Chiefs. He was, you know, not this was not expected this year. This level of of just flat bad was not expected this year. But it was expected that he was going to take a bit of a step back. Maybe not in skill, but in role. That's why C.J. Anderson was expected to do so well this year. Even Ronnie Hillman, despite entering the year as a backup, was a viable fantasy option. Because they were going to run and run and run and run. 
You look at a guy like uh, Owen Daniels, uh, now Vernon Davis. They were supposed to be, you know, the tight ends, the the interior receivers, a little more of this offense. Kind of a, a win with defense and protect Peyton Manning so that he's still upright come January if they can make it to January. That was the idea. Unfortunately, in doing that, Peyton Manning has also taken a significant step backwards in skill. And and it's not working. It looks like Brock Osweiler is at least going to get the next start. And Osweiler, he's six foot eight. He has some clunky mechanics, but so does, you know. So does a guy like Joe Flacco, big guy with with not the quickest release or mechanics or anything. But but this is a guy who can at least push the football downfield. If you set up the right blocking schemes, I might even be tempted to leave a tight end in a little more often than you would with a normal quarterback to help protect Brock Osweiler really really try to establish that running game dump off game screen game hopefully Emmanuel Sanders is healthy something like that but it's bizarre because you're going to end up in a very 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 uncomfortable situation and this is uh in my opinion this is something that is much more uncomfortable than uh Rodgers and Favre in Green Bay. Now that played out on a much more dramatic scale, of course, because there were trade requests and Aaron Rodgers was getting death threats and Brett Favre was the golden boy who had spent his entire career there. Different scale, of course. But this is more uncomfortable for me. Perhaps just as a fan, it's more uncomfortable because you see Peyton Manning and he is suddenly not only mortal, but he looks lost. This is someone who, you know, and I I only say this in hindsight, of course. There was no way to know it would happen this fast, I guess. But this looks like someone who should have retired. And it's kind of heartbreaking to see this. Uh, You see it in any sport. Uh, Someone who holds on one year, two years too long, holding on to the dream and, and not really realizing how far their skills have stepped back. Because, obviously, Peyton Manning's brain is still as sharp as... He's not 94 years old. We talk about football players in this kind of meat market sort of way that is birthed from the scouting combine and numbers and and yada yada. Peyton Manning is obviously just as sharp as ever. But, seeing him try to throw a deep pass on Sunday was... it, It really was painful. He would put it up and it would resemble a punt. You know, and a few times earlier this season, he was able to step his full body, and I mean every inch, his toenails right to the tip of his hair into a pass and deliver one downfield. But it doesn't look like that's there. The The injury to the foot is obviously impacting that. You can't set as strong of a base. But if he can't get anything going downfield, you're kind of clipping the wings of Emmanuel Sanders, number one. You are also clipping the wings of Demarius Thomas, who should be one of the best, most productive receivers in the NFL. Instead, he is extremely limited, and it becomes obvious when the Broncos are going to go to him. Only on you know, third and long, they'll, they'll add some coverage to Demarius Thomas. It makes it really difficult on him. He has exceeded, or, or sorry, performed about as well as he could have been expected to. But it's tough times. Tough times in Denver. So the the awkward, the uncomfortable, whatever you want to call it, is going to come if Brock Osweiler gets a start or two and if he looks decent. He does not need to go out there, uh, you know, maybe like someone like a, a Kirk Cousins last season or Johnny Manziel now. And he doesn't need to go out there and put up 400 yards with six scores and steal the city. If he goes out there and he plays regular football just a decent game where he's making passes throwing downfield that alone is going to be enough to start the conversation and what i really hope happens is that denver gives peyton two three four weeks maybe gets him back for the last couple games of the season so he has no rust going into the playoffs and hope that that half month full month something off is enough to give him some added gas in the tank. Because I do not want to see Peyton Manning go out of the NFL in the playoffs with a performance like this. I don't want to see him with nothing in the tank, 
throwing for 25 yards, getting picked off in the playoffs and getting blown out. You know, it that was sad enough in the Super Bowl, but you know, you, you kind of had an inkling that he was coming back. But if that turns into his last game, it's not good for anybody. Speaking of injured quarterbacks, let's switch gears here. Ben Roethlisberger this week playing behind Landry Jones in Pittsburgh. Curious decision. Made a lot of waves beforehand. Aditi Kinkabwala tweeted out that Ben Roethlisberger was going to dress but not start. The obvious question is, if you're healthy enough to dress, aren't you healthy enough to start? Roethlisberger tried to get it together this week, uh, get over a foot injury. The The concern out of Pittsburgh was that uh, it wasn't a performance concern. It was that he would not be nimble enough to protect himself. That he would leave himself a little bit exposed because he wouldn't be quick enough in the backfield. Understandable, but I don't, I don't get why he dressed. Anyways, starting quarterback goes down early. Ben Roethlisberger, who I had on my bench in one of my leagues, put up 30-plus points. Ugh. But anyways, nobody cares about that. He gets up, puts up huge numbers. Now, I believe they're entering a bye week, so he's going to come back strong. All of you Roethlisberger owners, or a guy like me who traded for him a few weeks ago, and it's been choppy waters, complete QB1, he is back, and he's playing beautifully. Hopefully he's healed up. Looking around the league, we had the Washington Redskins over the New Orleans Saints. Washington... Somehow, out of nowhere, uh, 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 despite their ownership, despite uh, a lot of things that they do dumb, that they do wrong, that they... All of this stuff. They're kind of in a playoff picture. They kind of have a, a shot at the playoffs. The thing for them will be getting it done on the road, which hasn't been happening. Kirk Cousins hasn't gotten it done on the road himself. But Matt Jones with a big game. Alfred Morris, finally, finally, with a, a good game himself. Kirk Cousins put up some numbers, and that's one to watch. Now, the report... Now, we're recording this, uh, you know, mid-late afternoon on Monday. The report this morning was that Rob Ryan of the New Orleans Saints had been fired, which makes a, a, a ton of sense. Then the report came out, Sean Payton saying, you know what, no, he, he's not fired. We, we haven't made any changes Nothing yet, so keep an eye on that one. By the time you're listening to this podcast, he might already have his office packed up. That should, that really should be the the outcome of all of this. Not just because they're having a bad season, but because I think he's frankly a very bad defensive coordinator. If he's going to coach linebackers or corners somewhere, eh, fine, maybe, whatever. He shouldn't be a defensive coordinator. And then, one thing that... uh, I guess uh, another thing that bugged me, not in a bad way, not in a negative way, just a, uh, I guess a hot conversation uh, you know, on Twitter, online, watching the games this week, was the, the catch rule, the NFL catch rule. And just before we get into our studs and duds, some fantasy stuff, this was a hot one. There were, I'm trying to go through just in my head of when this catch rule came up, came up in the Packers game, came up with uh, Jimmy Graham, came up with Odell Beckham Jr. This catch rule of making the catch, completing the action, completing the motion. And, uh, you know, Chris Collinsworth uh, made a lot of sense about it. You know, just that there there needs to be some sort of more uh, hard-line rule. Whether you need to catch the ball and make three separate distinct moves, whether you need to catch the ball and and yell out a code word. I I really don't care. But it's... uh, it, it, it adds a very artificial feel to football, does it not? I don't know if anyone agrees with that, and I'd love to hear your opinions on this. Tweet in at the backup punter what you think. Do you have a solution for this? Does it annoy you as much as it annoys me, or, or am I just cranky? I, I don't know. But it, it makes it feel like a very unnatural sport. And, and we have this in all sports with replays, reviews, and everything. But it gets to the point where... Every time you see a catch, you're wondering, one uh, percent uh, of me is wondering, was it completed? Did he you know was there any bobbling? Uh, was there was there this or that? Kind of like how when a player doesn't make a catch, they immediately call for a flag, no matter what. And that's my biggest pet peeve in the world. I mean, shut up. But whenever there's anything close, you just get that feeling like, oh God, here we go again. <laughs> here we go. 
with the catch rule. So watch for that this offseason. That's going to be a big, a big thing on the NFL docket. Now, before we get into studs and duds, three up, three down. Three teams up this week. We've already mentioned most of them. We'll breeze through. Three up is the Cardinals, the Chiefs, because Peyton Manning didn't just hand it to them. They did play good defense, and the Redskins, playoff contenders, which is hilarious. Three down, the Green Bay Packers, who might be the victim of the biggest upset this year in the NFL. They look downright terrible on offense. Aaron Rodgers looks frustrated. They are not playing, or sorry, they're not calling plays well. They're not adjusting whatsoever. And it's, uh, quite frankly, frustrating as hell. Also down, the Saints and the Cowboys, but we already knew that. So let's get into studs and duds for Week 10. Start out with the stud team. These are the people who, hopefully, won you your week. Quarterback, obviously, we mentioned him, Kirk Cousins, but the stat line from that game, 324 yards, four touchdowns, zero interceptions. Having Jordan Reed in that lineup helps him out. RB1, Jeremy Langford of the Chicago Bears, 20 rushes, 73 yards, and a touchdown. Adds on seven receptions, 109 yards, and a score. Jeremy Langford is really pushing Matt Forte out of town next year. He absolutely is. And Matt Forte is going to end up on the open market with uh, not a lot of not a lot of interest, should I say? I don't know. Or is he going to be the starting running back for the Dallas Cowboys next year? Keep it in mind. RB2, Charkandrick West. And I, I include both of these guys because four or five weeks ago, Jeremy Langford and Charkandrick West, not a chance. And now look at them. They're winning weeks. Charkandrick West with 24 rushes for 69 yards and a touchdown. That's not a great day on the ground. Averaging uh, just under three yards per carry, but then added a huge reception, which came together to make three receptions for 92 yards and a score. Big week. Our wide receivers, I'm getting tired of giving it to Antonio Brown. We'll just consider him an honorary stud each week until he does something insane again. Wide receiver one, Michael Floyd, seven catches for 113 and two touchdowns. He's always battled health or the depth chart or something, but when you need him, he is very good. He's one of those group of 50 or 60 guys that you'll find in your fantasy league who's projected to get between six and eight points every week. And it's frustrating to dig through the mess and find them, but Michael Floyd, he's at the top. Martavis Bryant, wide receiver two, with six catches for 178 and a score. And then, wide receiver three, because I have to prove that I'm not biased here. I will even give a stud spot to a guy who I truly cannot stand. Doug Baldwin, seven catches, 134, one touchdown. I will not make any jokes about mediocre receivers because that is not a mediocre stat line. Tight end one. Zach Miller obviously had the big day, but nobody owns Zach Miller, so we can't give it to him. Jordan Reed did, Rob Gronkowski did, but we're tired of hearing their names. How about Crockett Gilmore? I suggested picking him up on waivers last week if you needed a streamer. He put up 10.2 with four catches, 42 yards, and a touchdown. That was a big savior for anybody looking for a a bye week. And he's a guy that I like any bye week as a streamer for, for any time because the Ravens are going to be playing from behind. They don't really have any targets or red zone targets, so what's wrong with Crockett Gilmore? And then defense, Kansas City Chiefs, 13 points allowed, five sacks, five picks. It was ugly. The dud team, Peyton Manning, let's not talk about it. RB1, CJ Anderson, let's not talk about that either. It was bad. RB2 on the dud team, Antonio Andrews of the Tennessee Titans, 11 rushes for eight yards. That backfield, It's a tease. At the start of the year, I pumped Bishop Sankey's tires. And you know what? For a week or two, it looked like my shot in the dark was going to be kind of right. Not a chance. I don't even think he dressed. Then it looked like uh, you know, Antonio Andrews was going to be the guy, and he was, but then he puts up this performance. Then are people going to go out and buy David Cobb? Well, this is a backfield I'm just not going to touch. Wide receiver one on the dud team, Emmanuel Sanders. With one of these frustrating performances you're going to see this time of year, every year. He wasn't at 100%. When he was out there, sometimes it was as a decoy. Four targets, but nothing. Zero yards. If you've got a goose egg in your lineup and you're still winning, then a lot has to go your way. Alshon Jeffrey, wide receiver two, with three for 23. And Jeremy Macklin is the wide receiver three, with three catches 
for just 17 yards, mainly because they they didn't need to throw downfield too much. They had such great field position, courtesy of Peyton Manning. And then tight end one, a guy who has showed up on this list a lot this year, uh, Martellus Bennett of the Bears, three catches for 18 yards. It's uh, This is why I've been saying for a few weeks now it's time to jump ship on Martellus Bennett. Uh, if I ever draft Martellus Bennett, which I won't do because I don't like him, but if I ever draft him, it will be for six weeks and then trade him. Eight weeks, then trade him. But this deep in the season, you don't want Martellus Bennett. And then the dud defense, shockingly, Denver Broncos. 29 points against, two sacks, no interceptions, anything else. And again, that was because of, really, field position and the score. They were put almost down by default. You know, Alex Smith didn't need to drop back and, and wait for routes to, to develop or anything. And plus, you know, Aqib Tlaib w- was out because he's an idiot. So, tough day for uh, owners of the Denver defense. Like me! How pleasant. So we're going a little long here. We're going over a half an hour already. You know I like to get you uh, in and out pretty quick. In and out pretty quick on, on your Tuesday before you hit your own waiver wire. So let's uh, just check... A few quick people to, to look for in your waivers. If you need to stream a quarterback, if you do. Of course, I like Blake Bortles always as a streamer against the Titans on Thursday night. It's a risk, because who is going to be sloppier? Bortles, his offensive line, or the Titans' defense? Thursday nighters always give a big number to someone. Well, who's it going to be? If you can get Carr against the Lions, that's a good one. He's probably owned in your league. What about Tony Romo? Hmm? Playing the Miami Dolphins, it's probably not a road I'd want to go down, but you know what? If you're looking for a Hail Mary, something to have fun with, why not? Tyrod Taylor versus the Patriots, that is one I like. I'm hoping the Patriots go up early, which is what happened in Week 2. Tyrod Taylor put up over 30 points, despite not really looking that good. Garbage time is critical. And then Ryan Fitzpatrick in Week 11 will be playing the Houston Texans. I like that matchup. If I'm looking for a streamer, I'm probably, uh, you know, definitely going between Bortles, Fitzpatrick, and Tyrod Taylor. I'm always tempted by that Ryan Fitzpatrick, but uh, Tyrod Taylor probably has the biggest uh, high ceiling potential. If I just want 20, if I just want 20 points, go on Fitzpatrick. If I want 30, but I'm willing to accept the risk of, of 12 or 13, Tyrod Taylor. At running back, one that you might want to stash, or if you're a Lamar Miller owner, one that you should really handcuff, Jay Ajayi. Get him on the roster. He's getting some red zone work. He's a very good receiving back if they ever integrate him like that. Matt Jones at running back, uh, he's a guy that in, in most leagues I look at, he has been off and on rosters all year long. Maybe he's available in your league, maybe not. And... You know, he, by this point in the year, he should be owned. And I'm not saying this because of his performance in Week 10. You know, he, if he gets tackled on that big play, then maybe, you know, maybe he's not uh, so buzzy right now. But with Matt Jones, if, and this is a big if, obviously, now that they're making a run, but if the Redskins are, are out of the playoff race, they would be wise down the stretch to let Matt Jones carry the load for a few games. See what they have in him, you know, so they can see, hey, is this guy good enough to be our bell cow next year? And if you can line up with that and get a couple games of that on your roster, that's really valuable. And then maybe if you're looking for a flyer or a Charkandrick West handcuff, Spencer Ware did dress as his backup this week, so that's important. At wide receiver, one I will be looking at is Danny Amendola. Injury to Julian Edelman will at least keep him out for a few weeks, maybe close to the end of the year. Danny Amendola will be a big benefactor. Brandon LaFell as well, but he should be owned already. Doriel Green Beckham, again, he's on this list, but with Justin Hunter out for the remainder of the year with a fractured ankle, I think Doriel Green Beckham is going to be the main benefactor because kind of like I just mentioned with Matt Jones, uh, Tennessee, it is in their best interest to just throw footballs at this guy and see what happens. You know, see, see what they have for next year. So even if it's a bit of a science experiment, even if it's forced, it's not pretty, he might put up some numbers. And then looking at uh, the Baltimore Ravens, of course, Kamar Aiken is a weekly fixture here. One guy that I added this week, and he was 0% owned in my league, in my Yahoo league. He was probably single-digit ownership in other formats. Chris Givens 
and he gave me uh, over 10 points. He made it into the end zone. He is the starter across from Kamar Aiken, and he gives them that deep threat. Now, there's a risk. He's going to give you two or three points, but he's got that ceiling. I'm going to hold on to him. I'm pretty happy with that pickup I made. Then at tight end, obviously Eric Ebron, Crockett Gilmore, the, the usual suspects. Richard Rodgers, if you are willing to take a, a roll of the dice on a, a touchdown and nothing else, because if he doesn't score, you're not going to be happy. And then Austin Safarian Jenkins. Austin Safarian Jenkins would be a good one. If he's coming back from injury, of course. So monitor him. Monitor him through the week. Because James Winston looks good lately. He really does. And then what defense are you going to stream this week? Well, you know it's tradition for me to look at Thursday night defenses. Tennessee at Jacksonville. Or do you want Jacksonville at Tennessee? To be honest... I don't think you'll go wrong with, you know, with either. I, th- I think any time in Thursday Night Football there's going to be some level of turnover. If I can choose either, and it's not by much, you know, only 52% of my brain says this, but I'd prefer to probably have that Jaguars defense versus the Titans, just because I don't know what the hell their running game is doing. And, you know, is Doriel Green Beckham going to be able to handle all of these looks? I mean, their receiving core is thin itself. You know, there's, there's just a, not a lot going on there. Elsewhere, I would be looking at the Oakland Raiders playing the Detroit Lions. I like that one. Oakland at Detroit, if you can grab that. And the Atlanta Falcons versus the Indianapolis Colts. That one intrigues me. I, I've rolled out the Falcons as a, a sleeper here a few times. Hasn't always worked. I'll admit it. Shocking. But uh, you know, against the Colts, I'm not sure. With Andrew Luck out, it might be a, a, a good play. I don't think they're going to put up a 15 or a 20 by any means because I think Hasselback's going to take care of it. But they might be a good bet to keep the score low and work in the odd sack because they are a much faster defense this year. So that's it. Looking ahead to Week 11. So, hopefully, if you're hovering around that 5-5 five and five mark like I am, a couple times I'm above it, a couple times I'm below it, but uh, isn't that the story of it all? But uh, hopefully, if you're hovering around that mark, this is the, uh, the closest you ever get to below 500, and we can all, uh, all rise up above it, get into the playoffs here, and, and make a bit of a run. And, uh, and if you do need anything, anything at all from the Backup Punter Podcast, reach out on Twitter, at the Backup Punter. Maybe you have a trade deadline that has yet to pass in your league. If so, that's a late deadline, but hell, hit me up with trade questions, waiver questions, who should I start, who should I sit, anything like that, anytime, and I am happy to chat, happy to help where I can, or just happy to give an opinion so you can take that opinion and do the opposite, because, hey, sometimes that might work out for you. So I thank you for tuning in again. This was episode 33 podcast still going strong you can find it on itunes if you're an android user it's also on stitcher which is a good uh, podcatcher is that what people call it podcatcher i uh, i don't like shortening podcast to pod it feels too uh, too hip for me i don't feel like i've earned saying pod it doesn't sit but uh, you can also catch it on that uh, stitcher app there as well so subscribe and follow along i'm a uh, I'm really considering dropping the uh, the YouTube function, but if you do watch it there each week, let me know, and then I'll know that uh, people are out there using that, and I'll, I'll keep it going. And you can also find that at thebackuppunter.com. So, I said it last week. We're going to say it again. Next week, we're going to hope for a just football show. We're going to talk about only football. And by the end of next week, I think we'll be able to get a little deeper into some not playoff races, but playoff pictures. Really, uh, you know, set the scene. What has to happen, what might what might not happen. And, uh, and also, by the end of next week, I'll be a little more comfortable looking at the bottom of the league. Because keep, keep in mind, you know, this isn't just a fantasy football podcast. This is a, an NFL draft podcast once that season rolls around. So next week, maybe, we'll take a little bit of a look at the, at the bottom, at the bottom of the barrel. Are the Dallas Cowboys going to be in that conversation? Maybe. Is Rob Ryan going to be employed? Maybe. These are just the wonderful unknowns that keep us afloat, entertained, and, eh, whatever. 
through the, through the NFL week. So I hope you enjoy week 11. I hope your fantasy team enjoys it as much as they can. And I look forward to talking next week. So this is Keegan Matheson of the Backup Punter, hoping that all of your punts stop on the one-yard line.